It is my honor today to um, introduce Erez Lieberman, uh, Aiden, Aiden Lieberman, and, and John Baptiste Michel, who will be discussing with us today um, all the exciting work that they've done in, in cultural romics, an exciting new field that uh, they've helped uh, found. Um, I will keep this short, but one uh, story I would relay is that at the engineering school at CIS, um, these guys are known as the, uh, the pan-disciplinary guys because the word interdisciplinary was used so often in all the website and all the brochures and the materials, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, but there was some concern that no one is really truly interdisciplinary in their work. Uh, Erez and, and JB, as he goes, um, is actually uh, completely defies that stereotype. And if you look at, um, at the New York Times story that broke two months ago with uh, their leading um, science paper, um, that uh, they, they have uh, managed to um, include Google, MIT, uh, HMS, the engineering school, and almost every, every institute at Harvard in their work. And I think that is exactly why we want them here today and why what they are doing is so, ex is so exciting, is because they are truly breaking down barriers and helping especially the humanities um, do exciting research um, and explain to the other sides of the academic aisles um, why, why humanities matters. And so with that, I'm going to give it uh, to you guys. And uh, one reminder is to please Please turn off all your cell phones if you can. Uh, it's important there's so many electronics in the room, we don't want any interference. And then finally, uh, this talk will be recorded, and so uh, your questions will be saved for posterity on the internet. <laughs> so, um, so, so bear that in mind. Um, um, Amar from the Berkman Center might interject um, at the end during the Q&A with questions from Twitter, but otherwise, uh, please um, write down all your questions, and at the end, we'll have some time for those. Okay, so thank you very much, guys, and take it away. Hey, it's a tremendous, uh, tremendous pleasure to be here. Thank you guys so much for inviting us. Uh, we're here to talk about culturomics, uh, quantitative uh, analysis of culture uh, using, in this particular case, millions of digitized books. I'm Erez Lieberman Aden, who's my collaborator, John Baptiste Michel, uh, and we represent all kinds of organizations that tolerate us. Um, let me kind of give you a bit of an overview. Uh, there's all kinds of things that you can do. <laughs> Uh, at the Harvard Library. In fact, there are certain things that undergraduates are required to do at the library um, that perhaps uh, is a little bit odd. But anyway, the traditional thing when you're not doing that is to read a few books very, very carefully. You find some books that you are interested in uh, and you read them very, very carefully. Um, that's, that's a pretty good method. The problem is you'll never get through the whole library that way, um, which you might find distressing. Well, here's another approach. Uh, you could read all the books, uh, but do it very, very not carefully. Is there some benefit to doing that? Well, that's really the question that we're going to tackle in this talk. Uh, and more precisely, the question that we're going to tackle is, can we use computational methods to get a macroscopic view of an entire civilization by reading all books very, very not carefully? All right, so we're going to give you a quick principle, a very quick principle of why that uh, can be an interesting method, because it's true that one might really wonder, if you're not reading books, what are you doing? So um, we're going to start with the English language. Uh, there's a very nice thing about English verbs is that they're very regular. So this, so to express the past, you just add a little particle to the present. Like this uh, distinguished professor over there would say, um, today I still am, yesterday I still am. Very easy. Now, of course, uh, that doesn't hold in the most important of the cases when you're, for instance, chased by a big rock, you'd say uh, that rock almost got me, not get at me. So uh, some of the verbs in the English language are not regular. They do not conform to this regular equation. And those are the irregular verbs. Now, the nice thing about irregular verbs from uh, our standpoint as uh, mathematicians interested in cultural evolution is that they tend to become regular with time. Like, for instance, this is a cartoon that's, uh, that was described in the past uh, financial crisis. Remember the money you were saving for a rainy day? It shrunk. So in the future, this will certainly be uh, it shrink because verbs <coughs> become regular. So that's a very nice feature for us mathematicians. And we wanted to quantify that to say, let's take this uh, evolving feature of language and let's look at how it changes over time. So here is our plan. Uh, there's lots and lots of stuff that's been written in the English language over time. It looks kind of like this. Uh, so we would take an irregular verb that we're interested in, for instance, of the verb to see, uh, and uh, we would take all of the forms of to see, and, and we would just write down whenever any of them occur in this text. I mean, of course, uh, we're not going to do this, right? Uh, 
Um, but if, if we found a thousand undergrads, right, then we could deploy essentially all of these undergrads to go through all these texts and write down all these <coughs> verbs. Um, and so that seemed like a pretty reasonable plan to us. Uh, you know, so flyers went up, undergrads were informed, and uh, one showed up. <laughs> <laughs> but she's a very, very good undergrad, so she makes up for the thousand. Yeah, she's a, a wonder grad, if you will. <laughs> Why is she so uh, wonderful? Well, so the plan was, look, we can't read all the primary sources, uh, so why don't we read some secondary sources? We'll take 11 grammar textbooks spanning Old English and Middle English and uh, use them to compile a list of irregular verbs in Old English, which are still in the language today, and try to figure out what happened to them. Turns out that for... Uh, <coughs> For these 177 Old English irregular verbs, 145 were still irregular in Middle English, and 98 of them are still irregular today. The rest of them have all regularized. So now, you can arrange these verbs, because we like to make charts for mathematicians, so we put them in a big table. So these are the 177 verbs that were irregular 1,200 years ago. Now, the verbs that are most frequent, we put at the top of the table, to be and to have, to come, do, and find. The verbs that are very rare come to the bottom of the table, to delve, to bind, to span. Now, we covered these verbs as a function of whether they are now still irregular or whether they have become regular with time. So as you can see, the verb to be and to have are irregular verbs are in black. The verb to starve or the verb to melt are regular. They come from the regular equation, they are in red. Now, if you notice, as you go down this table, it becomes more and more red. So this exemplifies the fact that when verbs are more rare, they regularize faster. <coughs> this mirrors the very simple thing. If you're not reminded of stuff, you will forget about them. So here at this level of society, if you're not, remember, if you're not reminded enough that these verbs are exceptions to a rule, you will just use the rule to conjugate those exceptions. And they will disappear from the exceptions and they will become regular verbs. And this is what we observe here. Now there's a very simple mathematical feature, which is a if a verb is 100 times less frequent than another, it regularizes 10 times as fast. This just emerges from the table that I've shown you before. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, we have a nice equation here that uh, relates the half-life of an irregular verb to the square root of its usage frequency, which is really neat for us. Um, this is something that whatever model you have of evolution in the English language, the model must come from to this. This is an experimental feature, an empirical feature that shows how this particular grammatical rule has been evolving over 12 centuries. So if you come up with a way in your mind of how <coughs> English should evolve, it must reproduce that. So that's something that could not have been known if you hadn't looked at uh, language the way we did. So this is one example of why it's useful to this type of computational uh, large-scale analysis of language and culture at large. Now in addition, you can actually make very nice pictures with that, which is always nice. So here's a friend of mine, Jonathan Saragosti. When uh, we told him about this result, he said, uh, oh, but that's really nice because uh, here's what happened. At the beginning of time, somebody took the English language and he put it at the top of an hourglass right there. All the verbs are irregular. To have, to think, to drive, those are all irregular. And then as time goes by, those verbs fall through the opening of the hourglass. So by doing so, they gain this little ED particle. So they become regular. Now, of course, some, some verbs are much more used than others, so they're much bigger. Like to have and to think. So it takes then much more time to go through the opening of the hourglass. So that explains the result. And uh, so, we send, so when we send the paper to Nature, and we were very lucky to have it accepted, we also send them the picture. And they thought that the picture was so nice, they had to put it on their cover. <laughs> so that, that really made our day. Cool. So that's a proof of principle that you can try to do this kind of thing for several years and not immediately end your scientific career. Um, so. Uh, Thus duly encouraged, we, uh, we set out to do this better. Uh, let's <coughs> review what we've learned. The best thing you could possibly do if you wanted to quantify history, if you wanted to get some sense of historical trends, is to read absolutely everything, record it, write it down, make a very, very beautiful table, right? Let's just get the thousand undergrads, a million undergrads, and write this down. And if there were a y-axis for awesome, this is about the most awesome thing you could do. The problem is that if there were an x-axis for practical, <laughs> not a very practical approach. So what we did was the far less awesome, but far more practical approach of using secondary sources. Still, we have always dreamed of getting over there into the upper right quadrant. Now, 
why is it that uh, it's so <coughs> impractical to be there? Um, well, yes, the reason it's so impractical to be there is that we're just two guys, right? So us doing it could take a very long time. But of course, if you could find somebody else to do it, why, that would be very practical indeed. <laughs> Turns out that Google, since 2004, has been very, very, very rapidly digitizing uh, every book they can possibly get their hands on. So suddenly you have this option, which is both extremely awesome. You've got all the books, you've got all the words, everything ever written, but also practical. So now we went to Google and we told them about this idea and they said, okay, let's give it a shot. So what we wanted to do really is to make a tool that anybody could use. We're not really interested in reproducing our study and just publishing it, but we're interested in making something that anybody could use. So a measurement tool for uh, history or cultural trends. Now that means you need to release data. Because if you just do everything behind a firewall, nobody knows what's going on and there's no reproducibility, so there's no real science. <coughs> so we need to release data. Now, Google has digitized millions of books. Uh, the ideal data release is to take those full texts of the millions of books and to release them in the wild. So now, of course, there's, there's a y-axis for how awesome that is. It's very, very, very high. But um, we're taught a um, very simple principle, which is that if you have five million authors, say, five million books is five million authors. Five million authors is five million plaintiffs. So if you release that, it's a massive lawsuit. And of course, for us young scientists, it's not so great, not so practical. So that solution, we did not retain. Now, of course, as we always do, we try to go for the more practical thing, still a bit awesome, but not that much. And uh, so we thought, well, okay, we have these millions of books. We cannot release the full text. What can we say about them? Maybe you can release some statistics that are useful. It will never be as useful as the full text, but it might still be quite useful. So here, the statistics that we have decided to, to release are uh, what we call n grants. So a gram is a word. A two gram is a two word. Like a table is a two gram. And a five gram is five words, the United States of America. So n gram by extension is n words. So we decided to take, to count the number of times n grams appeared. So there's an example, for instance, in this uh, image here, there's uh, the four gram, a gleam of happiness. <coughs> so what we do is we take this four gram and we ask how many times it appears in books that were published in the year 1800 in books that were published in the year 1801, 1802, 1803, 1804, and so on until 2008. So that, that gives us a trajectory of how much this particular program was used. And we do that for all the five grams that appear in the books that we have been looking at, which amount to five million books total. So that gives us a table that is about two billion lines long, about 500 columns wide, and that tells us things about the way uh, phrases, words, and sentences have been evolving over the course of the last few centuries. And that's what we have released. Now, um, let's just give you a general overview of uh, where all of this uh, data is coming from. So for centuries now, since the invention of the printing press, people have been writing books. Uh, many of them have few cartoony <coughs> faces depicted in the top row. Uh, what, once they got their books, where did those books go? Some of them were retained actually in publishing houses. Uh, the vast majority of them that we still uh, keep track of uh, live in libraries. Um, and Google has been taking those books from the libraries and publishing houses and digitizing them. So we approached Google and we said, hey, you've got all these digitized books. Why don't we work together and try to create some kind of corpus, uh, massive collection of texts that we think is reliable enough for uh, the types of studies that we want to do. Now, it turns out that of the 12 million was the public number when this figure was made. Now it's 18 million uh, of the books that have been scanned. Um, not all of them were suitable for use. There's two major reasons that we couldn't use a book. One is we didn't think the metadata was good enough. For instance, the book you know, claims to have been written in 1703, but we don't necessarily believe it. The other is the scan isn't necessarily good enough. So somehow we don't have a good uh, sense of what the words are in that book. The pictures aren't good enough, or the algorithm that recognizes uh, those characters, the OCR, optical character recognition algorithm, somehow it said, hey, this book doesn't look terribly good. So we had to throw lots and lots of things out. In fact, we threw out about two-thirds of the database. What we were left with is five million books to analyze. And uh, as uh, JB just described, what we did is create this table using those five million books where we trusted the data and trusted uh, the metadata and made this table showing the frequency of words and the phrases over time. And here we're enormously indebted to Yuan Shen, uh, Matt Gray, and, and John Orwan our collaborators in, in making that step possible. So now, uh, when, we, when we got this data, we did a lot of analysis with it that we're gonna show you 
in a second. And, um, and we published it in, in the Journal of Science, which is right there. And again, somebody had made a nice picture that we could send them, again, put them on their cover. So again, it was a great day. And th this particular picture represents, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually an image. It's not a digital picture. It's an image from a sculpture. Uh, there's this artist, artist called Matei Ten who uh, makes sculptures with uh, thousands of books, tens of thousands of books. And here he did kind of like did a, a very big um, power with it, which is not as tall as, as, as it looks because there are mirrors inside it. So that when you look into it, you see the reflection to, to the infinity. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that if you try to count the books you see in this particular picture, you see, I think, around 100,000 books, right? So this is still uh, 50 times uh, smaller than all the books that, that we could analyze in this study. It's still far more than uh, the number of books you could read, but you know, it's uh, far less that we can read when we're not careful. So the point is, with this data, we can start uh, doing very nice things with cultural evolution. So here's the state of the art as of six months ago about irregular verbs. So if you're interested in knowing about the verb to thrive, you'd go to a leading scholar, a uh, contemporary scholar, Stephen Pinker, with uh, amazing hair. And you'd ask, <laughs> Steve, so how about the verb to thrive? How, how should I uh, conjugate it? You tell, you know, most people they say thrive. I know a few, however, who would say throw. There are very few. And then you'd go 200 years ago, and you'd ask this other distinguished gentleman with equally fantastic hair, how about the verb to thrive? And he would tell you, you know, in my days, people throw. Just a few of them thrive. That's pretty much it. <laughs> and, um, and you'd actually not even know where these points are. You'd say, it's mostly blue over here, it's mostly red over there, that, that, that's it. And now with the, we're going to show you two lines of this two billion line long table that, that we have done. The lines that correspond to thrive and throw. So this is uh, real data that should unfold now. So this shows you the trajectory, year by year, since the year 1800 to the year 2000, of the word throw and of the word thrive. So you can see exactly when the shift occurred, how fast it occurred. You can see that people don't always thrive. There's um, less thriving here than there is thriving over there. And uh, so it delivers a very quantitative picture of grammatical evolution. In fact, nobody had ever observed grammatical evolution, the evolution of irregular verbs that way. This here we can capture the exact moment when that occurred and how, how big that was. We knew that things evolved, but we had not seen it. That's a picture of it. And we have, so that's two lines out of the two billion lines. So the re, you know, those, this table is at least one billion times more awesome than this one picture here. <laughs> so I want to show you a few of these examples. So there's two reasons, uh, there's two ways that you can tell yourself that what you're doing is not nonsense um, in, in a study like this. The first is, you know, sort of garbage in, garbage out. If you include lots of books that have bad data or bad metadata, you're going to get trajectories that make absolutely no sense. So we did our best to make sure that wasn't the case. The other thing is that after you have the database, you can start doing sanity checks. You can say, look, I know that certain things get big at certain times. I should be able to see that in my data. And here are two examples of that. This is from the English language corpus. So we took 43 heads of state, uh, people who became president of the United States uh, or some equivalent position in their country. Now, usually, becoming head of state is, is pretty good in terms of getting your name out there. Um, so we said, OK, well, is it pretty good at getting people's names out there uh, in our data? So we lined everybody up so that their zero year was the year in which they ascended to power. And then we computed their average trajectory. And you can see very, very, very clearly that there's this very dramatic rise uh, for these leaders at the time that they ascend to power. Similar thing uh, we did with treaties. So if you take a treaty, people very, very rarely talk about treaties before the treaty is signed. There are a couple of exceptions, but by and large, people don't really talk about treaties before they're signed. They said, OK, let's take 124 treaties, uh, just the list of treaties that we downloaded from Wikipedia. Uh, let's take all 124 treaties, and let's just plot their frequency over time relative to the date of their signing. Uh, and again, as you can see, there's this very, very clear and dramatic rise uh, right after the treaty is signed. So that tells us, in, in sum, that not only do we think we're putting pretty good data in, but to the extent that there are phenomena where we know at a certain time this should spike, at a certain time this should exhibit this feature, we actually are seeing that in our data. So we have some confidence that when we're showing you all these kinds of trajectories, what we're showing you is to some extent reflective of culture at the time uh, in the language that we're interested in. So we like irregular verbs. We've been doing all this stuff on irregular verbs going back many years. So it was kind of irresistible 
to uh, say, okay, we've got this microscope. We can point it at anything that we want. Let's look at, at the irregular verbs. Yes? Can you talk a bit about why you like irregular verbs? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so, so the reason that we like irregular verbs is the following. Um, first, they worked. Uh, everything else didn't. Um, we we don't need to talk about the things that didn't work. Um, anyway, a, a, a perhaps more uh, suggestive uh, answer in terms of why they work is the following. So irregular verbs have this unique property. Uh, people have been talking for, for some time. So the irregular verbs have very, very high frequencies. High frequency things tend to be irregular verbs. Uh, low frequency stuff tend not to be. So why, why is that? Why do the irregular verbs have such high frequencies? People have talked for some time, and, and we expand on this earlier in the talk, about the fact that low frequency irregular verbs tend to disappear. So what you had is actually a very, very neat situation where with an irregular verb, on a kind of course pass, you actually have a Boolean, you have a Boolean property. Is the verb regular or is it irregular? You can just say one or zero. And you also have this other property, namely its usage frequency, which you can measure precisely and which is continuous and which is related in some monotonic way to its fitness. So you actually have a neat situation where you have a fairly measurable phenotype and you have a fairly measurable continuous fitness function. So it makes for a good combination in terms of trying to do an evolutionary study on some cultural <laughs> phenomena, right? I mean, if you look at tables, right, what's a table? You know, how does table change over time? It's very, very, very hard to track. How often are people using tables? I don't know. How many tables were made this year? Who knows? So irregular verbs solve a lot of the problems that are really difficult about tracking culture. It turns out that actually, you know, now, we, now we're playing with power. So we're not necessarily stuck, but, stuck there anymore. But not because irregular verbs tell us anything particular about our culture. Um, well, it's, not, it's not about meaning. It's, uh, it's, no, it's not about the meaning. The, the interesting thing is that people have been talking about cultural evolution for a long time. And there have been very, very, very few uh, measurements of what that could be. Irregular verbs are a very nice instance of that. Yeah. The, the other thing that's neat about the irregular verbs is what you're seeing is really the emergence of a rule. The ED thing is, is a rule, uh, is a grammatical rule. It says when you form a past tense, you add ED. Uh, the irregular verbs are holdovers of dead rules. So you have this really nice phenomenon you're studying, which is about the propagation of a rule in a language. So there's a, a nexus of interesting things which have made uh, irregular verbs the objects of study for, for decades. I mean, they've just fascinated people for a very, very, very long time and make them a really good object of study here But as I well. think you, you shouldn't get us started too much on irregular verbs again because we can talk about them for a long time. <laughs> yeah. so, there are many other interesting things I want to show you, so. But anyway. Since uh, we are talking about irregular verbs for a little bit longer, let's tell you. Let's tell you about some regular verbs. Uh, this is actually largely underreported uh, in the media, but you should hear about the verb chide. It's the fastest verb on the planet. It's gone from a usage frequency of about 10% in the regular form. People used to say chode 90% of the time. Now people say chided 90% of the time in only 200 years. That's actually incredibly fast for an irregular verb, and it makes us very excited whenever someone says that they chided someone else. Now, of course, we tell you that irregular verbs disappear, but sometimes it's not the case. Like some sneak in. The verb to sneak, for instance, was actually a regular verb that has become irregular in the last 50 years. So it's Steven uh, Pinker who I think pointed out that sneak snuck in on the pattern of <laughs> <laughs> it's on the pattern of the verb to stick, sneak, sneak, uh, sneak, snuck, stick, stuck. I think this is probably why this happened. Um, so and this is one of very the one example that we know of things that have become irregular. Um, we can track irregular verbs uh, in different countries. So the United States, they're leading exporters of verbs, leading exporters of many things, and leading exporters of regular verbs in particular. So here's the evolution of uh, the verbs that end in T. Burn, burn, learn, learn, smell, smell. There's a class of these, and they have become regular much faster than the others. And in fact, we can, so in the beginning of 1800, both the US and the UK tended to use these verbs 25% uh, of the time in the regular way. Now, the US really took a lead on the UK very, very fast, became regular in 1858, and the UK only caught up in the, the late 1950s. So, uh, so it's interesting. So the way we did this, by the way, is that we compared the usage frequencies in books published in the US versus books published in the UK. So this is how we're able to tell you something about US versus UK language. <laughs> of course, it does not correspond to exactly the American language or exactly the British language, but it is definitely enriched for this, for this language. <laughs> So the irregular verbs are something that's actually very, very measurable. Everyone kind of understands them, so that's cool. Um, 
But what we wanted to do is say, OK, we've got this crazy microscope. Can we point at it at the types of things that you couldn't dream about measuring? I mean, if you were you know, a physicalist in the Vienna Circle, right, you would take concepts like collective memory and say, that, is, you know, that doesn't mean anything, and it doesn't mean anything, because you obviously you could never measure anything like that. So we said, OK, let's, let's try to measure something really, 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 really vague. Uh, so let me tell you the history of the year 1950. Um, pretty much no one gave a damn about 1950 for most of recorded history. Uh, through the 17th century, the 18th century, the 19th century, no one cared about 1950. In fact, through 1910, 1920, 1930, no one cared about 1950. Only starting sort of in the mid to late 40s, people realized, hey, 1950's really going to happen, and we better get ready for it. There started to be a little bit of a buzz about 1950, but nothing made 1950 interesting like 1950. <laughs> <laughs> During the year 1950, people were just walking around obsessed. They couldn't talk about anything other than things that were going to happen in 1950, things that had just happened in 1950. They were just totally fascinated by 1950. And in fact, this persisted for years after the fact. 1951, 1952, 1953, people were still kind of debriefing. Gosh, 1950, what a fascinating year. So much change. And then, as with all things, 1954 rolled around, and people realized, hey, 1950 is kind of passe. Let's just <laughs> move on. And they have, at rates that we can measure. And what's interesting about this uh, is that when you look at the history of the year 1950, it looks exactly like the history of 1910, more or less. It looks more or less like the history of 1883 or any other year that we have on record. In particular, what we see are two very striking features. Um, one is that we, we talk more about time uh, than we did before. Uh, the other is that there's actually two phases in this process of forgetting. There's this very, very rapid forgetting phase, what we might call our collective short-term memory, and there's this much longer uh, phase, which we might call our collective long-term memory. So we said, okay, that's great. Let's test our memory. Let, let's figure out what the half-life is of, of the collective short-term memory. And so we plotted that over time, going back about 150 years. And what you can actually see is that the rate at which that falls off used to have a half-life of somewhere in the mid-30s. Now it's around 12. So the extent to which we lose interest in the past is getting faster and faster with each passing year. Right, so of course we look at how we forget about things, but we also learn new things to think of. So for instance, there's technologies. So if you look at uh, telephone, for instance. Telephone was invented around the year 18, 1850, over here. Um, but it started being mentioned in books only 25 to 30 years later. Nobody talked about the telephone, presumably because there weren't really wires and people really couldn't use the telephone, even though it was invented in principle. Uh, now, the radio did not have the same fate. Radio uh, was broadcast much, much faster after it was invented, uh, close to the year 1900. So there's this idea here that for any invention, we can probably measure how fast it starts entering culture. Here we took inventions invented in the first 40 years of the 19th century, the, second, the following 40 years, and the again following 40 years. And we ask, we take all these inventions, and we ask when did they, when were they invented, and we look at their trajectories, their aggregated trajectories. And we see here that basically the inventions that were invented in the early 19th century took longer to really increase in the culture than inventions invented closer to the 20th century. You can see here that as a function of time, it looks like the trajectories of inventions uh, is just um, becoming faster. Inventions, so new technologies, penetrate culture faster than older technologies. There can be many reasons for that, which, uh, which, are, which we don't know about. There are many hypotheses. The fact is that this is data about the way technology penetrates culture. Data was pretty hard to measure if you don't have these types of tools. Now, the next thing about uh, you know, new and old is that is fame. So we're all people, we're, we're some, some of us get famous, some of us don't. And there's an interesting question as to how that happens. Who are the most famous people of any given, born in any given year? And what does their trajectory to fame look like? So what we did is we went back for every single year in, in the last two centuries. We said, who are the most famous people born in that year, the class of 1850, the class of 1855? Here we're showing you the uh, trajectories for the 50 most famous people born in 1871, the class of 1871, if you will. And we can learn a fair bit about fame just by looking at their names. 
Uh, so Orville Wright, he was involved in claims. Ernest Rutherford, or Ernest Rutherford who won the Nobel Prize for uh, scattering experiments in physics. Uh, Marcel Proust, he wrote books. So there's an incredible array of different ways in which people get famous. But what's interesting is if you kind of look on the average at the class of 1871, what you see is that it sort of takes a while before anyone notices them. No one really cares about the class of 1871 and 1883 because they're all kind of 12-year-old punks. You know, yeah, Oracle, that's really cute. I'm sure someday you'll fly. Um, but then eventually they sort of start to get noticed. And what do we mean by get noticed? We mean that their frequency crosses the frequency threshold of about 10 to the minus ninth, one part per billion, which is the frequency of the lowest frequency words in the dictionary by and large. So if you're as commonly used in the language as you know, an infrequent word in the dictionary, then we feel like you know, if you should be in the dictionary, then you've made it. Anyway, but these people, they don't just, uh, they don't just make it, right? As soon as they pass that threshold, they start this incredibly, incredibly rapid ascent then they hit a peak, and then this sort of slow decline as we forget about them. It turns out that you can measure that pretty, pretty quantitatively. So this story here that Jerry has just told is the story of any class, the class of 1871, the class of 1865, the class of 1920. And um, here, so for any given, so this is the median trajectory of the 50 most famous people born in 1865. There's an age at which they become famous. And this age for this law is 34 years old. Then there's a, how fast they rise to fame. It turns out that it's an exponential rise. Every four years, in this case, their fame doubles. So with four years, people talked about them twice as much in books as they used to before. Then you reach a plateau at the age of 70, uh, peak, sorry, at the age of 70, and then people start forgetting about you, of course. Um, <laughs> but they forget about you much slower than they learned about you. That's pretty good news. And anyway, by the time, <laughs> anyway, by the time this is actually, you know, not, not as meaningful than you, it's been a long time that you're not here anymore. But the point is, these parameters, although they capture each and every trajectory, they have changed a little bit. So the doubling time has become faster. We've, we now, celebrities born in the 1920s became uh, uh, famous much faster. Their fame ri rose much faster than celebrities born in the 1800s. Doubling time went from eight years to close to two years. Every two years, these people become more and more famous, quite as famous. This is very, very big. And of course, the age at which you become famous is, has become uh, smaller. So celebrities born in the 1920s became famous before the year they were 30. It's very uh, So who knows? And this is, this is a study that was done uh, on people that really probably did not benefit uh, from the televis television, for instance. So now, with the current media, internet, and the television, I'm, so one can only wonder how fast this is changing again. When you say mentions doubled, is that as a percentage? of all words in a given year? Yeah, yeah so, right, right, so all the, everything that we're showing you, so everything we're showing you is the, so the frequency of a word to us is the number of times that word was seen that year divided by the total number of words we saw that year. So okay. it's, everything is uh, normalized for the number of books that year, or the number of words that year. Do you know how much, you see all this uh, increasing speed of, of the half-life? <coughs> uh, do you think that's just reflecting the half-life? So I think that uh, I may be wrong, but I, I imagine that the technologies linked to the speed of publication uh, do not have an effect that 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 would change by a factor of five the, the half life of, of fame in this case. I think pro probably the you know faster published technologies would change by by two or three years how how fast information that have actually occurred penetrate culture, but I, I doubt that they would affect the speed at which they rise afterwards. Does that make so? So there, but but though you're completely right that there is a line between when something occurs and when it is recorded in the book record. You need to write about it and you need to publish it. This line seems to be as far as we can tell from all these studies, two to three years. So let's maybe hold additional questions and then and dispute at, at the end. Uh, because the thing is, I feel like probably uh, many of you in the audience are like, oh, this is very interesting, but how does this relate to me? But actually, there's good news, uh, which is that uh, many of you are actually uh, uh, quite young. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I wanted to give you some, some advice, a, a heart to heart with, uh, with data. All right, look, you know, what should you do, right? People are interested in getting famous, right? You should know, what are your, uh, what are your options? 
Uh, there's a whole bunch of different strategies uh, you can engage in to get famous, and so we looked at the 25 most famous people engaged in different strategies, things like becoming a political figure, uh, or you know, becoming an author, becoming an actor, becoming a biologist, etc. How does that work out? Well, it turns out that if you want to get famous fast, then you should become an actor, because actors become famous in their mid to late 20s. Uh, they kind of be become famous sort of pretty rapidly, and then kind of plateau. Now, bear in mind that these are old people who were born between 1800 and 1920, so these actors are not benefiting from the television age. Anyway, they, at the age of about 40 or so, were kind of plateau, um, and that's it. So you're young, you're famous, uh, that's great. But actually, if you want to be rather more famous, you could wait a little bit longer till you're sort of mid-30s. Uh, and be a writer. Uh, writers, after their mid-30s, start to get more and more and more famous, but actually can, can peak uh, at much higher levels than actors and will persist for even longer. Still, if you really want to get famous, uh, and you're really willing to uh, delay gratification, then what you should do is become a political figure. Because, of course, of our 25 uh, most famous political figures, 11 of them became presidents of the United States, 9 became heads of state of other countries. Uh, they had to wait till around 50 or so to become famous, but when they became famous, they became more famous than any of the other groups. There are certain things that you should not do uh, if you would like to become famous. <laughs> I mean, in principle, you could become a biologist, an artist, a physicist, or a chemist. That's kind of like being an actor. Uh, you will get equally famous, but you'll have to wait till you're 65 or 70 to do it. Um, that's kind of waste of being famous while you're alive. But anyway, it's kind of up to you. Uh, the thing is, and this is, this is really a rookie mistake, definitely don't do what we did. <laughs> do not, under any circumstances, get tricked into becoming a mathematician. The problem with, uh, with, with doing math is that nobody notices. Uh, people say, oh, <laughs> mathematicians do their, their best work when they're young, which I guess is great to get all the work out of the way, but still nobody notices you until maybe a tiny bit and, you know, when you're 80 uh, and are not necessarily in a position to do much about it. Now, there are many, so there are many funny things that we're going to show you after, and this is not one of them. This is uh, the effect of suppression and censorship on the, the cultural trajectory of these people. So here's a famous uh, Jewish painter, Mark Chagall. So we're looking here at his territory in the English books. It rises at some point and continues rising. There are some accidents along the way, like that of anybody else. Now, let's look at the name Mark Chagall in books published in Germany. This is what happens. Uh, the red trajectory here. So it becomes very famous, and then, then it starts decreasing. It starts decreasing here, too. That's fine. But now it reaches zero between somewhere between 33 and 45. This is not something that happens <coughs> to famous people. It's very, very rare. It's uh, surprisingly, uh, not that surprising afterwards uh, when you realize what happened between 33 and 45, but between those, uh, during the Nazi regime, there was an enormous amount of suppression, and we see that very quantitatively in those trends. It's so surprising, actually, that um, we have been able to, to find the evidence of censorship in many cultures. So, for instance, you can take the case of Jesse Owens. So, Jesse Owens is a remarkable uh, figure in the history of athletics. What did Jesse Owens do? Well, um, he won four gold medals in track and field in 1936 uh, at the Olympics. That's great. That made him very, very famous right in 1936. And you see that huge spike right in 1936, the English corpus. That's interesting. What's sometimes much, much more interesting is where and how he did this. He did this in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. And of course, Berlin in 1936, Hitler is in charge. There's this ideology of the racial supremacy, the Aryan race, the inferiority of other races like the African race. And the track and field events, these are the most prestigious events of the Olympics. So Hitler wants to make an example here of the superiority of all of his athletes. It's going to be very public. It's going to be in Berlin. Trouble is that Jesse Owens wins four gold medals. I mean, it's just the most direct and public repudiation of the Nazi ideology you could possibly imagine. So it is interesting to see what the German response was, what the responses that we see in the German corpus. And basically, you see that same surge in interest in Jesse Owens, but you don't see it until 1945. Basically, this gives us maybe some sense of the sort of psychology of uh, what it is like to live under a totalitarian regime that is controlling information. I mean, we kind of laugh you know, when the Iraqi information minister says, oh, everything is completely normal but you know, there are Abrams tanks rolling in the background. 
But in point of fact, you know, in this case of Jesse Owens, you can see very clearly illustrated that if something happens, no matter how public, uh, that directly repudiates the dominant ideology, just pretend that it didn't. And that can actually work on the scale of an entire civilization. So we see that happening in many, many governments. So here's for the three uh, heroes of the Russian Revolution, Spotsky, Zinoviev, and Kamenev. Uh, they're both very famous before the Stalin did not like them anymore. And uh, two of them were executed. One of them was assassinated. Now, when you're assassinated, typically your friend tends to shoot up. So here it drops, and it maintains, it becomes suppressed for the next 50 years. This type of suppression here, this again, this is really uncommon. You have to wait for the perestroika for the memories of these people to be restored in books written in Russian. We see such examples not only with people, but with events too. So here in Tiananmen Square, two big events occurred, one in 1976. And we can see here in the English books that we we'll probably uh, talk a little bit about Tiananmen Square due to that event right there. In books written in Chinese, we talk a lot about that. Now, of course, in uh, our Western cultures, what we remember most about Tiananmen Square is not what happened in 76, but what happened in 89. Indeed, you do see a sharp uh, shoot up in the, um, about mentions of Tiananmen Square in books written in English. We do not see that in books written in Chinese. Very likely, this is the result of uh, suppression about this particular event. Now, it's not only uh, totalitarian regimes and, or, or, or other types of regimes, it's also here in the US. Uh, during the second Red Scare in the US, these people were asked, so these were uh, Hollywood writers, Hollywood directors. They are known as the Hollywood Ten. They were asked by the Congress to come testify about their supposed links with uh, communists. They refused to go. They said, no, it's really good. Uh, movie executives gathered and said, these guys, we're going to blacklist them in the sense that they're not going to work for us anymore. They're not going to be credited in our movies anymore. They're out of the picture, literally. And you can see that the trajectories of these people after 1947, when that occurs, dramatically goes down. This is the median trajectory. It goes down to 1960. It's only in 1960 that Donald, uh, Dalton Trumbo was credited in a movie called, uh, aptly named, Exodus, in, in case. Um, and you can see sometimes a very uh, heavy weight of, of decisions in this case. Yeah, so here's, here's a great example. So Albert Maltz, he's one of the Hollywood 10 that JB was just telling you about. Uh, it's interesting to compare him to the trajectory of Ilya Kazan. Uh, can you actually raise your hand if you know who Albert Maltz is? Can you raise your hand if you've ever heard of Ilya Kazan? This is, this is pretty striking. Now, why is it that you don't know who Albert Maltz is, but you know who Ilya Kazan is, uh, by and large? Because actually, Ilya Kazan, up till 1947, was less famous than Albert Maltz. Albert Maltz was doing pretty well. Uh, the thing is that both of them get asked to testify before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Uh, Albert Maltz stands on principle, refuses to name names. Uh, Ilya Kazan does not. Uh, he says, my career is not worth it. He names names and has you know, forever been associated with that fateful decision. Uh, but let's see how that affected his life. You can see that Ilya Kazan goes on to have a tremendously successful career. Albert Maltz's career uh, really kind of peters out uh, after that decision and suffers enormously in the 13 years in which the blacklist is enforced. So it's really interesting how you can take this kind of data and use it to give you a quantitative picture of an ethical decision that individual people made at individual moments in time and the consequences that those decisions had for their lives. Probably, if uh, Albert Maltz had decided to name names and Ilya Kazan had decided not to, uh, all those hand raises would have been uh, precisely inverted. But half the time, Kazan's getting mentioned as a spineless king. I mean, mm -hmm. he, his name is there in the negative kind. It's true, but half the time, he's also being mentioned for cat in a hot tin roof, you know? So Actually, we don't know that. We don't know that, in this case, he's being mentioned in the negative or well, That's my point. You don't know. It just You just know his name's in a book. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's absolutely true that there are, you know, when you look at these texts, many of them are negative, uh, many of them are positive, many of them are neutral. But the thing is, he's still around. He's still someone who people know about. Uh, Albert Malt is... Spell his name right. Yeah. So we wanted to take a closer look at one of these uh, phenomena, um, in particular uh, the Nazi censorship that took place uh, during the Third Reich. So what we did is we started taking the blacklists that the Nazis produced. Uh, in fact, there's a Nazi librarian, Wolfgang Hermann, who created blacklists. And they were very, very systematic about this, as, as with many other uh, of, you know, horrifying things that they did. And so 
uh, Wolfgang Herman, in his blacklists, actually writes down all these names of people you know, who should be pulled out of libraries. And, uh, and he actually categorizes them. He says, oh, you know, here are the philosophers who are bad. Here are the people who are writing about history uh, who you know, we shouldn't have around anymore. Here are the people who are writing about religion. It's very, very, very systematic. And in fact, his blacklists formed the basis uh, for the 1933 uh, book burnings in, in Berlin and, and throughout Germany. Um, so we took those blacklists and we said, well, how have the blacklists affect uh, the you know, lives uh, and mentions of people who were mentioned on the blacklist? So there's four blacklists there from Wolfgang Herman, his politics, literature, history, and his philosophy and religion uh, blacklist. We also added one more, which is the names of all the artists in the Degenerate Art Exhibition. Uh, the Nazis took artists that they did not like uh, and they created, instead of just getting rid of their work, uh, they got rid of much of their work, but they also took some of their work and put it in this sort of mock exhibition where they just made fun of it. Uh, they called, called it degenerate art. It circulated uh, all around Germany. So we took those five blacklists. Uh, and what you can see is that for, for each of the blacklists, there's a decline. And then we also compared them to a collection of names of uh, Nazis. And you can see we can actually measure, sort of get some sense of the effectiveness of these sort of blacklisting uh, information control schemes in, in the different groups. So for instance, the artists decline on the whole by about a factor of two. Um, the philosophers, we're writing about philosophy and religion, you see a decline about a factor of four, actually, in terms of mentions of them. Whereas if you were actually on their history blacklist, it seems that the suppression was somehow not as uh, complete as effective. Maybe that wasn't as high a priority. Uh, they only declined about 9%. Uh, during the Third Reich. Of course, in contrast with the Nazis, there's a 500% increase uh, in mentions of them. So now what that all tells us is that all the signals are so strong that we should be able to detect censorship and detect suppression without knowing about it, without having to know who was being suppressed. So let's case in point here is Henri Matisse. If I knew nothing of Henri Matisse during the Nazi years, I would say, I know his fame before, I know his fame after over there, now, his fame during should be somewhere between the two. So I would say that his fame is over there. But I know that, if, that he's being talked about as much as that. So now, this, the difference between those two points, or the, the ratio between those two points, gives me a, an index for suppression. I can compute that number for all 700,000 names that appear on Wikipedia. And then I can say, if that number is very, very big, maybe it's suppression. If that number is very, very uh, large, maybe it's propaganda. If it's nothing, it should, it should be pretty much what I expect. Here's the distribution of suppression indices for um, 5,000 names in English between 33 and 45. There's nothing special that happened in terms of censorship of people uh, in English books between 33 and 45 that we know of. And indeed, the distribution of suppression indices is tightly centered around one, which means that what you observe is pretty much what you expect. People are talked about as much as we, we thought. Now, uh, in German, German books, very, very different. We have a distribution is whole shifted to the left, which means that it's a logarithmic scale here. So actually, this, this shift is quite important. People are talked about much less than we would have thought they should. And more importantly, the distribution is much wider. So it means that there are many more people that, that are being suppressed than we, we, we would have expected. Here, Pablo Picasso is talked about 10 times as less as, he, as we would have predicted. And there are also people at the far right of this, um, in terms of suppression index, at the far right of this distribution here, which are who have talked about more than we would have thought. This is probably due to propaganda. So now we have actually um, looked at these names, and we have uh, compared these results with, annotated, with the manual annotation of these names. And we found really striking results between this quantitative method here and uh, the results of a human annotator. What that is, is that it tells you um, it's something, if you're a historian and you're thinking about Nazi censorship and you want to know who are the people who have been censored by the Nazis, how are you going to find, find this out? You can try to read all the books and then see that as you, go, as you progress through the Nazi years, there are some names you used to see but you don't see anymore, so probably they were censored. That's very, very difficult. You can use this method to propose a list of people who probably were censored. So you take all the people here, you give them to a historian, and the historian says, ah, okay, so these are candidates for suppression. Now I'm going to go and check whether these names were actually suppressed or not. So it's not something that replaces the work of a historian, it's something that completes it. And 
point of fact, we actually took many of these names from the extremes, mm -hmm. sent them to an historian working at Yad Vashem, and said, okay, we're not telling you which, which extreme they come from, uh, but which do you think? And in, in point of fact, their qualitative assessment uh, matched very, very well with this sort of quantitative algorithm. In, in fact, there's, uh, you could take names like, for instance, Hermann Maas, who is at the furthest extreme. Uh, he's a Protestant minister who spoke out against what the Nazis were doing. Uh, he's one of the most extreme values uh, in our distribution. He was actually later recognized by Yad Vashem for his activities during the war. <coughs> so anyway, so we had this sort of uh, you know ability to do this, but it's it's much less fun if you know it's just like two people who can do this kind of thing. Um, so we said, well, we've got to make this data available to people. And so a couple of weeks before the paper came out, you know, we. Uh, approached our collaborators over at Google and said, hey, we, you know, we've really got to get you guys to take our prototype and create a web-based version of it. And uh, they did an amazing job, actually, uh, led by sort of John Orlock, to put together this tool in uh, two weeks flat, uh, which is really amazing and, and gives, you, uh, it gives you and then sort of the rest of the world the opportunity to play with this kind of information. So let me tell you uh, what, what this is. This is Google Ngrams viewer. It lives at ngrams.googlelabs.com. Uh, you can type in a word or a phrase, uh, and you can see how frequently it's used over time. So in th this particular case, uh, people decided that they were interested in whether the United States uh, is a plural or not. In, back in, in the early 1800s, people used to refer to the United States as a plural. The United States are strong and their economy is doing very well or whatever they might want to, want to say. Uh, these days, we refer to the United States in the singular, the United States is. So people have been debating for decades, uh, sometimes actually over a century, how, uh, when did that transition happen? When did we start thinking about the United States in the singular? And people have said all kinds of things, uh, but they haven't been able to just look. So with this, you can just look. It turns out that the transition, the 50-50 point, uh, is around 1876. Um, and in fact, if you actually look at inaugural, inaugural, inaugural addresses of uh, presidents, you can see that before uh, that period of time, before the window around the 1870s, uh, the inaugural addresses tend to refer to the United States in the plural, pretty much exclusively. Uh, there's a, about a 30-year window of time where they kind of do both. And then after that, they're referring to the United States uh, entirely in the singular. The interesting thing is that you don't have to take our word for it. You know, this number, you can actually check it for yourself in the sense that if you're interested to see examples of the United States are in context, you can click uh, around here, I think, and you can, that will lead you to Google Books that contain this particular sentence, and you can actually see it uh, highlighted. Cool. The United States are subject to the extremes of heat and cold. This is still true uh, today in Boston. Yes. And uh, <laughs> so, what, what, so what that does to you, what that does is, this is the front end for a digital library. So if you have a library with uh, millions of books all over the place, how are you going to browse through it? You can do the classic way, which is kind of with a card catalog. Or you can have uh, a way which is like that, where you say, I know this term is interesting. I'm not necessarily sure uh, what particular feature of that phrase or sentence is interesting. I see here that there's an abundance of this term there. I can click on it and open it. And so, um, and actually, we're working with the Harvard libraries to uh, develop such a browser for, for them, for the Harvard libraries. So this is a pretty powerful way to browse uh, digital libraries. Now, so I, and I, I think we right. just also wanted to um, make another point, which is, you know, because we've gotten very, very used to this whole kind of card catalog method, and especially as there are increasing discussions about things like DPLA, Digital Public Library of America, um, it's going to be important to start thinking beyond just sort of card catalogs types of interfaces that we have now to new types of interfaces. Interfaces potentially, you know, like the Ngram viewer and all, all the types of future ways in which we're going to be able to visualize books on a global scale uh, in order to think about what what the interface really is going to be for, for the digital libraries in the future. Now, so, after so, yeah, this, so I think we have, like, we have to speed up because I think that people want to ask questions. But before we do that, I want to present to you the Ngram. Yeah, yeah, well, the well, Ngram is or, right? So, 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 so an important thing to know, right, is that we launched this thing, right, and within 20, so nobody at Google actually thought it would be useful. They were like, oh, but why should we do this? Because only like 100 professors will use it. Uh, but then it turned out that actually within the first 24 hours, there were over a million queries run on the Ngram viewer. So it became, became quite 
quite the thing. Um, and so, of course, there are Oscars, um, and you know, there are uh, you know for good movies, and there are Grammys for good music. And so we thought, oh, this is great. We should give uh, N Grammys for uh, <laughs> for good N Grams. So the first one goes to uh, the best foreign ever. So um, so you know, today we want to uh, do our best, put our best foot forward, and uh, do everything as best we can. Uh, well, this person here, this is an example of a query that was actually run on the first day. This person here looked at best and, and realized that actually in the late 18th century, nobody cared for doing their best. They were not interested in putting their best foot forward. Rather, they wanted to do their best. Put their best foot forward, <laughs> be the best they can be. So a, what, what's going on here? And actually, there's a very, very simple uh, explanation for that, which is uh, uh, character recognition error. Right? So there's the, this thing called the medial S, which is that uh, you would like to, there's a different way of spelling the S here in this case when it's in the middle of the word. Um, this was not uh, uh, incorporated in Google's optical character recognition at the time we did the study. And so they recognized this as an F. So that's why we see so much best uh, things in the early days. Of course, we re did report this fact in the very, very extensive hundred pages of documentation uh, all about uh, you know this paper and how you use it, but nobody was interested in reading that because it's like if you have your fun new gadget toy, etc., you know you're not going to read the instructions. And so that's actually a really good sign that people were enthusiastic about it. Uh, here's an, another interesting story. So uh, man goes into his uh, condo association meeting. Older gentleman there, he says, you know, says some sentence, uses the word Fortnite. Nobody knows what he's talking about. He gets very upset. Uh, but our hero uh, is uh, very resourceful. So he boots up the Ingram viewer and he says, look, you know, Fortnite, it's much less frequent uh, than it was many fortnights ago. Uh, <laughs> he shows it to this older gentleman who understands. Uh, and so tension is diffused. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it's great that among other things with the Ingram viewer, we, we believe we are bringing peace. Now we're also uh, helping uh, marketing firms uh, think outside the box. <laughs> you know, they want to incentivize so they can strategize uh, their synergy in certain ways in very goal-oriented ways. So that is very successful at the end of the 20th century. So I think that's a pretty important marketing feature. Now, so, this frustration. <laughs> frustration. So this is a study of a very specific kind of frustration. It's the one where you bump your foot in the table and go, argh, like this. This is a 2A arc. You know, very, very popular in the in 1982, there's a surge of 2A arcs of frustration there. We think this might have had something to do with rating. <laughs> We're not so sure. We can't, we can't confirm nor infirm it. Uh, it turns out that we can study the, 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 the arcs of frustration until the 8A arc, and uh, you should not look at what's going on there. It's very, very often. Now, it's not, it's a very different arc than the piratic arc, which is with many arcs. It's arc different than this one. Just, just making it clear that you're not confused. So there's lots of other things that people have actually done with the raw data. So not just the running things on the but the entire 2 billion uh, raw data set available. So for instance, the Times of London uh, created this little app that tells you how good big your Twitter vocabulary is. Um, and you know, I don't know how good this app is, but uh, it certainly got really, really popular, actually trended on uh, Twitter, which is cool. Um, another cool thing uh, that, that folks did, this is a student working with us, as well as John Bohannon, correspondent for science. So science was rolling out this paper that said, let's do something interesting uh, with this data. And so they said, well, you know, what should we do with it that's interesting? And they thought, hmm, uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had a science hall of fame? Now, how do you usually generate a hall of fame? Well, usually you get a whole bunch of kind of older people, and they all sit around in, in some room and cogitate in unknown ways and decide who is actually important of the football players. Uh, but of course, in science, I guess there was some kind of shortage of older people to cogitate, which is kind of hard to understand. So anyways, this somehow never got done. Uh, so we said, oh, well, we're scientists. Let's do this in a scientific way. Uh, and so they took uh, all of Wikipedia, and they took all of the scientists who are on Wikipedia, and they kind of algorithmically ran them through the system to figure out who the most famous folks were. Um, and in fact, they also defined a unit of fame. They said, you know, Charles Darwin, he's really, really famous. We'll call him one Darwin. Um, and then everybody else is usually measured in milli-Darwins because it's very, very hard to be as famous as Charles Darwin. Just to give you a sense of things, uh, Stephen Pinker uh, is in the 30s, about 30-something milli-Darwins. Uh, so it's very, very hard to be as famous as Darwin. Right, so, and then uh, people at Wikipedia thought that they could actually take this uh, gold standard of fame, the milli-Darwin, to, uh, to ask, um, if, when you're famous, do you get a good Wikipedia article? So they have this, uh, they have this uh, internal measure of how good the Wikipedia article is. When it's green, it's, uh, it's good. When it's uh, red over there, it's not good. Now if you notice, uh, there's something that happens here. If you rank the most famous man by fame, John Dewey is very famous, 
uh, his ranking is pretty good. Now, if you rank the most famous women by fame, you see that the ranking of the article is empty. So this is not the most perfect way to see it, but, but you do see you, when you control for fame, women tend to have articles of poorer quality than men. It's already known that Wikipedia is written uh, at 80% by men, but uh, does it really have to reflect on the quality of the article for men and women? So that's uh, so far an open question. But I think um, we, want, we, want, we want to close here uh, our remarks, which is uh, culture mix, we named it for genomics. Culture mix is the application of high throughput methods to the study of culture, basically. Now, uh, we start, uh, oh, yeah, like we start, with, we start with books. We know full well that books do not contain all of culture. There's many, 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 many other things that make up culture. There's newspapers, uh, there's, uh, there's non-textual sources also. There's manuscripts for really hard to decrypt that, that go way back. There's maps, there's pictures, and paintings, and sculptures, and canoes, and whatever you want. So um, there's many things. However, what's interesting about today is that these things get more digitized. The present is more, much more, more and more digital, but so is the past. Google and many other companies and uh, universities and uh, uh, nations are digitizing these objects of history. They are digitizing the past. The past is becoming more and more digital. And when you have the ability to have all these things, to look at these things from a computational standpoint, we argue, and we have demonstrated in part, that it can be very useful to have uh, methods of looking at these objects that are not uh, as careful as the ones that we currently have, looking at these objects in the millions. So what the, the, the last very interesting thing about it is that we don't need to wait for copyright laws to change for that to be useful. So the books that we have studied, most of them are under copyright. But by releasing the data we did about them, we didn't release anything that was under copyright. We just released statistics. And these statistics hold some very interesting information. So even if today copyright laws still hold us back in, in the research world, uh, we can still gather millions of digital objects that are under copyright and do interesting with them that don't break copyright laws. And one of the things that's actually really neat is that since this paper um, came out only a couple of months ago, people have thought, oh, this is, this is kind of cool. And actually, they built a whole bunch of Ngram viewers uh, on their own. So for instance, you know, there's Google Ngram viewer, but Columbia newspaper said, oh, this is a cool way of viewing our data. So they put up their own Ngram viewer. Someone said, took massive uh, corpora of score, musical score, and said, oh, let's do an Ngram viewer for score. So you can plot, you can say, OK, I'm interested in the following note. How frequently was it used over time? So I think that what we're seeing is that we need to learn new languages of sort of multiple types. We need to figure out how to digitize all of these uh, repositories. But we also have got to figure out clever ways of representing the data, uh, ways that are engaging. Um, so we have that sort of vocabulary um, as these repositories begin to come online. So finally, we wanted to just thank uh, all the people who were involved in this study. Uh, many, 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 many people, in fact, hundreds of people uh, on the Google Books team, uh, especially John Olant, Matt Gray, Peter Norvig, and Dan Clancy at Google. Um, student of ours, Adrian Barish, a collaborator, Yuan Shen, my wife, Aziva, who came up with a great idea uh, about studying censorship. Um, Martin Novak and Steve Pinker from Vice, who was Pickett, uh, executive editor of the American Heritage Dictionary for his input on words, uh, and Dale Hoiberg, the editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia Britannica, as well as all of the people who funded us. Thanks very much. So uh, thank you very much. I think we want to do many questions. And if you can identify yourself briefly, your affiliation, and then state a question with a question mark. And then if we can couple them, <laughs> sorry, but it happens sometimes. And if we can couple them two or three questions at a time to batch process them for a resident JP, that would be fantastic. Um, who would like to start us off? Uh, Kyle Courtney, I'm with the Law Library. I just have a question about maybe forecasting. So I read a science fiction book called Foundation. Talk about using mathematical equations to study culture and history. Yeah, cycle history. Yeah, cycle history. Yeah, so can you, you think you can use this date, sorry, thank you, to project culture? I mean, because you're projecting fame, you're projecting how long it'll take for the decline of, you know, mathematicians, scholars, scientists, et cetera. I mean, I, I think you have to be careful with this kind of but, but it's absolutely the case that um, one ought to be able to make some sorts of predictions with this. I mean, again, you have to be really careful. On the basic level, the simplest prediction in the world is that any time you see a linear trend anywhere in all scientific fields, right, that the trend should continue uh, because most things continue to be the way they are, like first derivatives. Uh, and so that's going to apply to a lot of the types of trends that we've shown, but it's not going to apply to, to many of them as well. And so I think one of the things we need to learn is, you know, 
push our boundaries and, and learn what our boundaries are in terms of doing things like that. Effectively. Like, like we can have pretty in interesting numbers for aggregates. So we take you know the most of the 50 most eminent people or all the irregular birds, things like that. We, we could say with confidence that the trend w will continue. Mm -hmm. Now, for an individual query, for an individual word, an individual person, that, that's much, much harder. Andy McAfee from MIT. Have you come across any examples of small n historians, as opposed to what you all do, getting something wrong? I think it's, you know, small n historians as a collective um, often uh, have a wide variety of opinions. So, or were you usually. Were, were you were in the, the minority opinion turned out to be. We, we, actually, actually we actually have looked, uh, spent a little bit of time looking for that, not that much, and we have not found this yet. But we're hoping that as, as this progresses, this can be a tool that the way we think this interfaces with history is what? First, it can uh, give historians hypotheses on which to build. Mm -hmm. So say, oh, I didn't know about this thing. What? Why is it? So it's starting point for discovery. And maybe in some cases, uh, it can also prove or disprove or disprove some hypothesis. The key thing is that these hypotheses need to be formulated in quantitative ways. Yeah. And this is currently, like, by quantitative, I mean large-scale quantitative. And this is currently not the case uh, in most parts of, of, of what is I mean, there definitely are kind of one-off remarks that people say sort of without thinking, because it's never checkable, where people said, oh, you know, nobody talked about cabbage until the 30s, you know, when you see, you know, reports of cabbage in the congressional record and stuff like that. You know, so there are occasionally run into sort of one-off things like that, which you can check here and where you just know that people are wrong. You know, sometimes people say things that are dramatic, right, but did they really mean it, right? So there's an incredibly inspired piece of, you know, Civil War history that says, oh, yes, you know, before the Civil War, everyone said, you know, the United States are. Yeah. After the Civil War, everyone said the United States is, you know, like, so whether, you know, it was a singular or past tense was exactly what the war was being fought over. And this is a great, beautiful interpretation of states' rights. Uh, Etc. And it's, I was deeply inspired when I read it. I mean, it's kind of wrong, strictly speaking. Um, but I had no less inspiring for that reason. I don't know if you know the person who's writing it, you know, many decades ago. I don't know, you know, what they, what they meant by it uh, to, to to some extent. So, it's uh, it's definitely something I think that we're learning in terms of how to map qualitative historical claims onto quantitative claims and make them talk to each other. Uh, George Blakeslee, Leslie University. Uh, it'd be interesting with the presidential campaigns about to kick off to test the prediction concept with your fame trend analysis tool and watch the trends as they go to see if you could determine who the winner might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then again, I think the, this will be particularly relevant in uh, newspaper record, in the Twitter record, in like the much more uh, instantaneous media. Here, all these things again are really true in books. We think they might apply to some extent to other media, but they're really specific to books. One should really keep that in mind. You run me that one should keep that in mind. Another question? So there's somebody in the back. Yeah. Uh, you uh, focus on uh, text and uh, books. Uh, I would like to know uh, voice data. And uh, for, for example, uh, sound and uh, voice data as the classical music and music. Yes, that is a very important data you can consider about that. Definitely thought about these sorts of issues. There are um, pluses uh, about it. There's also minuses. Uh, one of the minuses, for instance, copyright law that you have to deal with, uh, says that if somebody transcribes a score, they now have a copyright on that transcription. Um, so that means that you all of a sudden have a digital world that is loaded with an incredible array of people uh, who have claims. Navigating that is, is very, very challenging. Uh, another challenge is that if a single note is off in a score, it's actually much harder to detect than, for instance, if a single letter is off in a word. Because if you take a word and you change one letter, like if you change even tinker to, I don't know, kunk for, you know, make the I into an L, that kind of seems very obviously wrong, um, or at least, you know, kind of very foreign, um, and, and therefore low likelihood. That, that kind of correction is actually much harder to do in the case of music. So there's a lot of uh, new challenges. And it's, it's obviously an incredibly important uh, area. And, and as uh, we mentioned earlier, there is actually currently a musical engram viewer that is run on a, a relatively small data set that you can yeah, get a sense yeah. of how that looks. We started with text because text is easy to interpret, much easier than uh, music or, or, or a movie or, or a sculpture. So we started with that, but we, clearly things are going to move in, to include that direction particularly. Yeah. There are sound recordings that go back about a century, so yeah. one, one could do some of this. Uh, do you have the, I'm Jason Kaufman from the Berkman Center. 
Do you have metadata to differentiate fiction from nonfiction and different genres? Um, we do. It turns out that uh, so yeah, the many answers to that. So at Google, for instance, uh, each book has a metadata. By metadata, I mean who's the author, when was it written, was is it fiction, nonfiction, whatever. Um, the way they do this metadata is by aggregating it from many content providers. There are many, many, many conflicts there. It's tremendously, it's a really difficult problem. So, for instance, we have done a fiction corpus. So we took all the books that were some, somewhere in the header that was fiction. This is enriched for what we mean by fiction books, but like something uh, like a scholarly study of Shakespeare's play will be a fiction book because it's about fiction. So, uh, so there, so in, in the data set that we have produced, it, it, it's not, it's not that clean. Uh, now, at the Harvard level, for instance, in the Harvard libraries, they have much, better, they have much more uniform metadata. So, working with them, we might be able to have a much better solution for it. So uh, we have time for three more questions, <clears throat> and I will throw in one if I may. Um, what are the implications as, as, as people like you and very enterprising companies digitize more and more of the world? What are the implications for intellectual property and copyright? Something that we think a lot about at the Berkman Center. Well, so I think one of the important things to think about um, that, that comes out of this, and I think this is a, a point that JB made as well, the approach that's being taken now, I think, in a large these many of these digitization projects, especially when they're not happening in the private sector, is like, oh, we're, we need to push for copyright reform uh, in order to make these things possible. And, and I think that's true to an extent. But I think tools like Ngram Skewer, there's many, many books that you can't access in any form in Google. That Google has digitized, but for copyright reasons, they cannot make accessible in any form except through Ngram Skewer. And if we can think of many tools like this, they might give us uh, enough of a case to make for ourselves that we should digitize this stuff anyway. Um, and there's going to be tons of stuff that we're going to be able to do with it. And then once we have also the strength that we're doing this stuff, we've got everything digitized, then push for the copyright as well. Because otherwise you get into this difficult situation where without the copyright reform, there's not much of a push to really do digitizing. Without digitizing, there's not as much of a push to do the copyright reform. George Mokrin from Central Square. <clears throat> Last week, I think I heard Ethan Zuckerman mention about censorship in China, so that people can talk about Egypt, but it doesn't trend. So the secondary data, the metadata, doesn't, it doesn't show up. So people don't know that other people are talking about China. And I'm wondering about that in terms of what you're doing with, with censorship. Sorry, what do you mean by it doesn't trend? Um, so that if you look. And see who, what the topics are. The, on Twitter, on Twitter or Facebook or, or or other things that are out there in, in the digital world, so you don't know that other people are talking about it. So the the suppress the suppress the indicator that uh, that's interesting. Well, yeah, I, I don't think that has any for, for our work. I don't think that has any consequence there, right? But uh, but it's uh, there's one word, one word about it is that. If you suppress the indication that it is trending, it suppresses the possibility of other people to see about it and to keep, keep it trending up. So there's, there might be, from a mathematician's perspective, there might be an interesting thing going on from, from a public policy standpoint. There's obvious implications. Yeah, there's extremely strong feedback loops in, in these types of things. And so if you cut those off, that, that certainly should have consequences. So you think that you could, if you looked at the data, you could be able to, to, to see that, parse it out? Yeah, it might not be impossible. Maybe there's some uh, features about how fast it rises or the nature of the rise that might be, in fact, uh, detectable. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's not impossible. Yeah, there's all kinds of subtle cues um, for for this sort of stuff. Like folks over at Archive, uh, so an Archive orders their the Archive's the physics, uh, you know, paper e-print Archive, um, and they always every day send out all the new papers and they order them. Uh, and so they've done really, really careful studies about how the order of those papers actually can have a dramatic impact on long-term citation statistics. Uh, and you know, if something goes wrong on a particular day and you randomly punk something else in that first slide, it actually has long-term consequences for all the papers involved. So those types of subtle mechanisms actually can be really important and really persistent. That's a very interesting point. Very interesting. There's a question behind it. Um, David Weinberger from the <coughs> Harvard Library Innovation Lab. Um, does the corpus have enough structural information in it so that you know what's in um, uh, words that are in headlines, subheads, indices, in tables, which are really interesting objects as well? So the, there are basic stuff that gets cut off, things like things in the header, which often will just contain the title over and over and over again. You don't want that. That gets cut off. Page numbers get cut off. 
Um, and so what you're looking at is really the, the meat of uh, the text itself, what the author wrote. Uh, the front matter be and the indices get removed, things like that. You know, words that, words and chapter, sorry, words and chapter titles and captions, is that sort of structure marked up? Because that can be very interesting and valuable to know it as a further level of analysis. Words that are used in uh, subheadings or... So the, the big challenge here is that you don't actually get this stuff. It, this stuff is not going to comment through an n-grams type um, well, it's structure. It's, we could, in principle, create like a caption n-grams corpus. Um, you, you, can mark it up. you can mark it up. Like you, you can say, instead of looking at just the word uh, burn, so instead you say burn plus indication that it was actually in, the, in a quotation. Or, but we can mark up the... It's, it's not impossible that it ends up on an n-gram. The, the main problem, though, would be to be sure that what you're saying is a header is really a header. Like, consider the problems that we had just being sure that the book was actually written in the year we were told it was written in. So now if you're talking about quotations and headers, it, with the volume of 5 million books that come from many different sources, it's really a very difficult problem. It's a problem that might be tractable at the level of a single university library today. Uh, yeah. So uh, two last questions on the left here. Oh, right. uh, so I just wanted to ask quickly about how your methods of analysis change versus stay the same whenever you uh, change your time scales. So like, because you're looking at, you know, orders of hundreds of years, but but if you do start looking at data sets like Twitter and this sort of thing, where the time scales shift, what is invariant and what has to change? So, uh, we're really, we're empirical scientists, so we, we are really driven by what is in the data. So we tend to, in fact, we started with this, with this data, we, we thought that, you know, we had many ideas about trying to look at, well, the, the questions that we wanted to look at were not at all the most interesting and we actually don't talk about them anymore. Uh, so we just look at the data and see what is there and then try to understand. So I, might, I, might, I suspect that uh, if we had a Twitter feed right now, that's what we would be doing. We'd be looking at the data and try to adapt to it. I don't, I don't think that we would necessarily um, transport directly some of these methods there. But the, there are some generic things that one thinks about uh, that probably would lift over things like what's the time resolution of your data? How much depth do you have at a given time resolution? Uh, so, for instance, if we want to have one-year resolution, we can throw less words into a one-year bin. If we want only 10-year resolution, decade-by-decade decade resolution, then we can afford to have a lot more words per bin. So we can look at the much rarer stuff with one decade resolution, with one-year resolution. The other thing that's crucial is that every medium can have kind of characteristic lag times. So, for instance, books, usually if something has happened at time X, there is a two- to three-year lag before people write the books about it. Uh, because publication just takes a very long time. Twitter is very different, right? We're giving this talk now, and in principle, someone could be tweeting something on Twitter right at this very, very moment. Uh, and so there's essentially zero lag. So questions like that about the lag of the medium um, and sort of how it works as an echo chamber in that way uh, can, can definitely have an effect on your thinking. It would probably be things that we would think about. Wahid Vanoni, Holt University. Uh, do you envisage that going forward you could analyze the opposite effect that is from words to meta tags? Um, by this, I mean, for instance, if you have Cairo, Sphinx, and Pyramid, obviously that article or that sentence is about Egypt. And the reason why I mentioned that or is. Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely, or Las Vegas. Time so. Exactly do screw you up and that could also be relevant in terms of censorship because sometimes you can talk about somebody or something without mentioning it. So that artist that was born in 1923 and so on and so forth. Thank you. Yeah, th this is actually, uh, Michel Foucault makes this point about censorship. He says, oh, censorship creates much more sort of discourses than, than it gets rid of. Um, and there's a sense in which when we talk about censorship here, we're, we're talking about a very particular discourse, which is discourse that involves Bergen's name. As you mentioned, there's many other ways in which that discourse can take place, and those are much, much, much harder to track. Uh, so that's, that's absolutely an issue that one must recognize. It's an important compound for these, uh, for these types of studies. Uh, as far as the statistical classification, um, I think you're absolutely right. That type of classification of determining the metadata from the data is possible. We spent uh, some time looking at that. And that's a very, very important direction. Yeah. Thank you. This is called making a language model. You can say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm given a language, and, I'm, and I make a model out of it. So for instance, you could then say, using that model, oh, this is a book from the 1700s by looking at how another book first went to that one. Then there are yeah, many people doing that. Great. Well, I think I want to say thank you very much for an amazing talk.